Hello, I'm Daniel Tamage, and in this video, I'm going to be going through what orchestration is, seven key points, and I will also be explaining one key difference when using orchestration in a asynchronous event driven system compared to a synchronous request driven, aka point to point system. And then I will be walking you through an example showing the flow of data between an orchestration service and the services needs to trigger using event driven architecture. And in this example, I will also be explaining how you can prevent message loss and ensure the system is reliable with three techniques. And once I have shown the happy path, I will also show you how you can handle unsuccessful events and rollbacks. And before I wrap up with the trade-offs of orchestration, I will discuss how we can prevent race conditions. Okay, so now let's get into what is orchestration. So the first thing to explain is what orchestration is. And a good analogy that people use is to think of a orchestra's conductor, because a conductor's role is to conduct the musicians to play in time and together, so they play the music correctly. And this analogy is used because in an orchestrated system, you have a central service or process which issues commands to worker services, the event processors. Then it waits for the processing outcomes. And when the event processor has processed the event, it would then publish its outcome, which the orchestration service would handle and trigger the next step in a given workflow based on the result. And now let's get into the seven key points. So the first one is orchestration is also known as the mediator pattern. And two, the orchestration service should not know about the worker process or the business process implementation. It should only know about the workflow logic and what to trigger in the workflow based on the worker's results. And three, event processors, the workers, should be self-contained, independent from each other, and the scope which workers manage could be a single function to a full-blown business process with multiple downstream services and could even be an orchestration service. And four, workers should only publish the absolute outcome from its processing because an orchestration service should not be responsible for triggering retries if a worker is unsuccessful in processing. It is the worker's responsibility to manage its retries and only publish this outcome when it has either been successful or it has exhausted its configured number of attempts to retry the request. And point five, now, even though I've just said it's the responsibility of the processors to handle its retries, in the request-driven point-to-point -point world, the responsibility of retriggering processors due to failures falls to the orchestration service because of the nature of point-to-point -point systems. And now point six is orchestration services are required to keep track and persist the state of processing. And point seven, orchestration services may need to provide reports to interested parties like monitoring dashboards regarding items processing statuses. And now let's get into the example. Now, don't be scared with this slide showing all the connections as I will be walking you step by step shortly. But first, I wanted to show you at a high level what a simple orchestration process could look like. And here we have one orchestration service with a persistent data store and four worker services with their own databases. And we have also have an initial command event topic for the process and request, which will trigger the process, multiple event topics for the process and events, and a final topic where the outcome of the full process would be published to, in order to notify interested subscribers of the result of the process. So let's dive into it. So the first step, would be for the orchestration service to consume the initial request, which may have been published by a public customer experience API or a back office service, which could be a function or an upstream event processor worker, which has been triggered by another orchestration service upstream. Now, once the orchestration service has consumed the request, it would create a new record in a persistent database table 
and the service would then publish the processing command to the first service, service A. Now, before I move on, let's discuss the first technique you can take to prevent message loss. And that is to always publish events synchronously to the mission platform. So yes, you would want to wait for the mission platform to acknowledge that the message has been successfully published and persisted to all the nodes which the topic is replicated across. So you do not want to publish events asynchronously and you definitely do not want to just simply fire and forget because that will lead to message loss. Okay, so now back to the example where we have the fourth step where service A will consume the event, process it and then publish the message synchronously in step five. Okay, so now this is an excellent time again to discuss the second technique you need to use to prevent message loss. And that is to disable auto commit or auto acknowledgement and enforce that all consumers of topics or queues must acknowledge a message or commit the consuming offset manually. Auto commit can cause message loss because the event consumer may fail to process after the commit has happened. Now, in the Apache Kafka world, the consumer's offset would be incremented and the message would not be lost. But if you're using another meshing platform, it would delete the acknowledged message. It would remove it from the queue and that message would be lost. So as you can see from the diagram, the orchestration service will now acknowledge that it has successfully processed the initial event. Now the orchestration service would consume the event, store the process in state in the database, trigger the next step of the process, which could be processed in parallel by two different services that handle other business processes. However, what happens if one is unavailable or only runs at certain times of the day because it's a batch process? And in this example, service C is a batch process and is currently not processing events, but service B is, so it would consume and process the event and publish the outcome. Now the orchestration service will consume the result update the state, but now it needs to wait for service C's result before triggering the next step. So it needs to wait. And when service C resumes processing, it would process and publish this result, causing the orchestration service to trigger service D. And service D would process the request. And in this example, I'm going through the happy path. So service D is publishing an event stating that processing was completed successfully. And because there are no more steps in the workflow, the orchestration service would mark the processing item as completed in the database table for future reference. And also publish the outcome to the final topic to notify other services or other orchestration processes. And that was the successful example. Now, before we go through how to handle failures, let's discuss the third technique on how to prevent message loss. And data loss and that is to ensure that the meshing platform you are using for your events is clustered and topics and queues are replicated and meshes when they are sent to queues and topics are persisted so even in case of corruption or server restarts you still have those events when the system resumes and now how do we handle failures and rollback so let's go back to the example now, what happens if service D is unable to process the request successfully? And as I mentioned in the key points, the worker, the processor, must manage this retries and failures or errors and only publish the absolute result in event-driven systems. And in this case, service D has tried multiple times and has published the processing outcome stating it has failed. So when the orchestration service cons consumes service D's failure result, it would then publish an event stating that the items processing has failed. Now, based on your requirements, you may need to publish this message before or after any rollbacks have happened. That's up to you and your requirements. And in this example, the orchestration service would now publish meshes to trigger service A, B and C because they need to handle rollback operations. And then finally, once all the workflow steps to roll back and handle failures have been completed, the orchestration service would then update the database to state that the process has been completed successfully. But of course, the actual request item would state that 
the actual business process had failed, but of course the actual request itself would have failed, but the orchestration service has successfully completed the operation and handled it correctly based on the workflow. Unless of course I unhandled exception occurred, and then you'd probably need to capture that and send it off to your operations team or support team or provide that to the development team for further debugging. Wow, well, now that was a lot to take in. But before I wrap up, let's quickly look at how to prevent race conditions. Because in the example I showed, there is one problem with having your orchestration service consume multiple event topics. And that is the fact that a race condition could occur. Because when a service is consuming different topics, there's no guarantee that the service will consume those events in order, oldest first, unless it was published to a single queue or topic which implements FIFO first in, first out. And that is why I love Apache Kafka because it is log based and order is preserved. But how can you have all the workers published into the same topic without coupling services together, especially if other non orchestrated processes? use the worker services in their operations. So let's look at two possible solutions quickly. The first is, is to implement the callback topic approach where the message publisher informs the processor which topic it should publish the processing outcome to. Now, if you wanna know more about the callback topic pattern, please watch my video about callback topics. I will put the link in the description below. Now, besides publishing to the callback topic, you can also have the services published to their own outcome event topics, which can be consumed by other services and used for monitoring. However, food for thought, if you're using Apache Kafka and you are publishing to these topics, you can use stream processing and stream processing allows you to process the events for multiple topics and output events to a single topic based on unions, joins, grouping, aggregation, and data filtering. And that output event would be published to a new topic which you could then further process or consume. And that is the second approach. Now let us wrap up with the trade-offs of having a centralized service to handle orchestrating multiple services. So the first thing to point out is it does introduce a higher degree of coupling between services. And if different teams maintain those services, then what could be seen as a simple change could cause development and release planning headaches, priority juggling, if multiple development teams are required to get involved in making changes. For example, you could have a development team owning orchestration service and different teams for the various worker services. And depending on your organization structure, it might be hard to coordinate changes. But on the flip side, if the orchestration service and workers are maintained by one team or teams that can easily coordinate changes because of their structure and deployment tools, you may not have any issues. And because you have a centralized process, it allows you to know exactly what the workflow process is and can be simple to monitor, track and report on because the orchestration service would keep state. Compared to using a non-centralized approach called chronograph, which is also known as the broker pattern, where the flow is designed at a global level without a centralized process managing the flow. And to monitor this, you generally need to pull all the processing outcomes for multiple processes into a centralized data store for reporting. And with Apache Kafka, you can do that with a streaming functionality as mentioned earlier. And finally, should you use orchestration? And the answer is yes. But should you use it for all solutions? And the answer is obviously no. Why? Because architecture is all about understanding trade-offs. You need to look at your company's requirements, development process, experience in the teams, and a range of other factors, including time, before determining if you should use orchestration in your next project.